And he had stripped me down so far that I was really despairing as to whether I could even ever have a ministry again. And there came a night when my wife and I were sitting on the couch together. It was almost midnight because the grandfather clock over in the corner of the living room was chiming out the quarter hours. That's how I know what time it was. And we had reached that place, I had reached that place, where we had prayed every prayer we knew to, knew to pray, had shed every tear we knew to shed. I felt totally unqualified to go on in ministry any longer. And we sat in absolute silence. But there was somebody moving around out there. And the next move was his. And at almost midnight, literally, the Spirit of God quickened to my mind those wonderful verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I had to get my Bible to actually look it up to get it all because I didn't, I, I was at university, I wasn't navigator, so I hadn't memorized the passage. <laughs> but it's where Paul says to the Corinthians, I don't want you to be unaware of all that I've suffered in the province of Asia. He said how it got to the place where I thought I was beyond my ability to endure any longer. He said, I felt like uh, uh, I had in me the sentence of death. You remember that passage? But then Paul says, but this happened in order that I might learn not to trust in myself, but in the God who raises the dead. And so in him I have placed my hope that he has delivered and he will yet deliver you helping us by your prayers. Here was Paul in the middle of a great missionary career, a spiritual giant if there ever was one, and God had let him get into an experience where he was in over his head, he was stripped down to nothing, he thought he was about to die, and then he realized the reason this is happening is because I still need to learn even more to stop trusting in myself, and to trust in the God who raised his son from the dead. And then he says, you know, he has done that before. He has delivered before. I know he'll do it again. I put my hope in him. And as I sat there, having read that passage in the darkness, I don't know if you've had this experience. It's not happened to me very often. But I know this was the word of the voice of the Lord speaking a sentence into my mind that has sort of been a compass for my life and ministry every day since then. And it was this based on that passage in 2 Corinthians 1. I heard the Spirit of God say to me, you have no ministry and you will never have a ministry unless I raise it from the dead with my son day by day by day. So I want to say to you, I don't know if I'm going to have any ministry to anyone in this room before this hour is over, but if there's any ministry going on here tonight, I want you to know when I woke up this morning, I didn't have that. It only happens if God decides once again to raise me out of the dead with his son to be what he's called me to be for that day. Dale Schlafer is here. He was sort of the executive overseer of that gathering that took place in 1997 called Stand in the Gap. I don't know about you, but I, th I still can't believe, even though I was there and some of you were there, that a million men would gather in the hot blazing sun of an early October day and spend six hours in prayer coming without any promise of who's singing or who's speaking or anything, just the call to come and pray for revival in this nation. I don't know about you, but I believe that only the Spirit of God could do something like that. And they had asked me, as along with a number of others, to give a little talk, as others did along those six hours, just to get people refocused. And mine was to be toward the end of the second hour. And there was a tent behind the platform where about 60 intercessors remained the entire six hours, and each speaker, not it's the, each, each person that gave a, a, a reflection, uh, was to go back there and be prayed over. And so I went back about 20 minutes before, and they gathered, and they started praying over me. And I had an experience that I had not had very often in my life, and that is I just began, that is publicly, I began to weep uncontrollably as they prayed over me. And I was trying to figure out what's going on inside of me. And then I felt like the Spirit of God was telling me not to say what I had planned to say, but to do what, in fact, I did do 20 minutes later when I got up and I opened up to Revelation 1 and I simply read the passage where John says, I heard a voice and turned and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ in his ascended glory. He sees his face shining like the sun, his eyes like flames of fire. You know, the word of the Lord coming out like a sharp sword out of his mouth. His voice like the thunder of many waters and how John said, when I saw him, I fell down at his feet as a dead man. 
And I read that passage, and I said to the men on the mall, I said, you know, all of our prayers these six hours really have, all of our prayers have one answer, and it's Christ. He's the answer to every prayer for revival on this mall today. So at this moment, why don't we, and this is what this, the Lord had spe- said to me as they were praying over me earlier, why don't we do what John did? And let's get prostrate flat on the ground, and we're going to take the next three minutes and be like dead men in absolute silence. What a view, what a scene, all the way back to the Washington Monument. Men on their faces, prostrate in silence. I had a fellow come up to me right after the whole meeting was over and said, you know something, I was standing, they had like a hundred some porta potties. He said, I was standing in line with about seven men at one of the porta potties and when you invited us to go flat, he said, everybody was flat on their faces. I said, I've heard of prayer and fasting in terms of food, but (laughs) this is a whole other approach. Uh, Actually, I've received so many reports over the years People coming up to me and saying it was a glorious meeting, etc. But the moment that really changed my life was those moments when none of us did anything. I've had pastors say to me, I had left the ministry and I've gone back in because what God did in my heart, on my face, those three minutes of silence. Two weeks ago, Dale, you're going to love this. Two weeks ago, I got an email from someone who had heard me speak some months earlier and had suddenly realized that I was the guy who had had people get flat. So he wrote me to tell me about his father. He said, my father was in his early 60s. Uh, We had been witnessing to him for some years. He was really hardened against the gospel, wanted nothing to do with it. When it came the opportunity to go to stand in the gap, we just begged him to please come with us. So finally he gave in and he came. And he said, when we got to those three minutes, my dad had sort of been sitting there just sort of watching everything. But when we got to those three minutes, he got down flat on his face just like everybody else. And then this guy said in his email, he said, and when the three minutes were done and we all stood up, my dad turned to me and said, I just accepted Christ into my life. (laughs) In total silence. But with the word of the Lord, describing the glory and beauty of the one before whom the silence was given. But there was another reason why I wept back there in that tent that day. And for a long time, I was not free to say this. In recent years, I have. And you can take it for whatever it's worth. But I felt like the father who told me to do what I did was also saying to me, and what you are going to see is a picture of things to come. For many years, I've often said, I think the greatest sign that we're in revival will be silence where the presence of the Lord in his gloriousness is so prevalent that in, in a sense we feel like we can't do anything. The next move is his and we're just listening. And then finally one last story about awakening that just helps to give it some substance is about a, a little over a, a year ago in the center of the country in a farm field outside Kansas City about 3,000 high school and college students came together from almost every state of the union for what was called paradise. It was about six, seven hours of nothing but worshiping the supremacy of God's son. There were no speakers advertised or seen. No no music worship teams advertised or seen. When they got to the field, there was a throne-like object in the center of the field and a big jumbotron that would help lead us in our times. And then we spent the next six hours or so in, in, in singing worship, in reciting scripture back and forth, in times of prayer, in times of silence. Some in this room were there for that experience. And we broke down the six hours into three major themes. Awake, adore, arise. And I've meditated on that an awful lot since. We had a lot of scriptures about awakening to Christ, a lot of scriptures about adoring him, a lot of scriptures about arising and following him to the very ends of the earth. And I thought, there is a logical sequence there of what we were experiencing, and it was all scripture and all prayer. In fact, there wasn't anybody preaching. It was all scripture. It was all prayer. We were preaching scripture to each other as we recited God's word back and forth. And I thought, that is the pattern of any Christ awakening. You awake to him, then you've got to adore him because you see him like you've never seen him before, but you can't sit back any longer. Now you want to arise and go with him 
even to the very ends of the earth. So a Christ awakening is God's spirit using God's word to reconvert God's people back to God's son for all that he is. Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now that's, that may be true about our original conversion, but it's also true in every reconversion. Revival is like a reconversion. It's God's people turning back from things from which they have wandered away, from the one from whom they have wandered away. And often in revival, it could be described by this verse that the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, creation. And the God who threw a back said that one day the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Creation and consummation is the God now who reintroduces us to his son in the most intimate way. It's, it's face to face. And unlike Moses, we see his face and we still live. In fact, we live more than ever before. So I believe that we're on the threshold and the great hope before us is this is what God's getting ready to do among his people. And we can pray and prepare with absolute confidence. We'll not be disappointed. Now, I'd like to give you seven reasons why we'll not be disappointed. Uh, don't write these down. I'm going to go through this so quickly. This is just to buttress your hope. I wrote a whole book called The Hope at Hand, which is not in print, so I'm not selling anything, where I took one chapter for each of these back in the late 90s. These are seven reasons why I have this great hope and why you can too. Just look at it. it it's so logical. I mean, if you want to write them down, fine, but it, you don't need to because the logic is so there. We can be sure this is what God wants to do because of the decisive person. God wants his son to have the supremacy in everything, Paul says. So it, God's commitment to revival is not, first of all, his commitment to me or to you. It's his commitment to his son and to do whatever it takes to give his son his rightful place among his people and beyond. Secondly, there's a divine pattern, and it's all through church history and the great awakenings that we've heard a little bit about in our own country are a part of that divine pattern. And the simple principle here is this. God has done it before. He is consistent in all of his ways. If he's done it before, and here's how I always say it, he is able, he is willing, and he is ready to do it again. It's a divine pattern. And then the dark prospects, all the things that are, that are besieging our world right now, things seen and unseen, all kinds of battles, seen and unseen. And maybe the greatest dark prospect is at this very moment, there are about three billion people in the world who have no knowledge of Christ, no one like them, near them, to even begin to tell them. And God, he loves that world. He loves the nations. He intends for his kingdom to be proclaimed among every peoples before the end comes. And he knows that apart from a church that is alive and revived and moving in the power of the Spirit and wholly sold out to his Son, the world has no other hope. So his commitment to the world means he's also committed to seeing that revival comes. And then he looks at the church and he sees what I would call a disturbing paralysis. That's my kind way of saying the spiritual condition we're in. A person who's paraplegic um, can think about, and I have a number of friends who are, can think about what they want to do, but they cannot do it. Their bodies do not cooperate. We in the evangelical movement know a lot of what needs to happen but somehow it's not happening. We're not having the impact on our culture or on the unreached peoples that we ought to be having. We can think about it, but there is a disturbing paralysis, and yet God is determined to advance the kingdom of his son, not without his people and apart from his people, but through his people. Therefore, I know he is committed to delivering us out of this disturbing paralysis and to bringing us back into wholeness and health spiritually as we ought to be as Christ's body. And the dramatic preparations. I just finished a book written by the two editors of the Financial Times, neither one of whom I believe are Christians, called God is Back. It just came out this year, in which they take about 300 pages to look at the emergence of religion, as they call it, around the world. But most of the book, I would say 90% of the book, is looking at the evangelical movement around the world. And they are impressed. Secular journalists have done their research. It is, prof it is the best overview of the evangelical movement I have read anywhere, Christian or otherwise. 
And when I get done reading, I say, God is on the move. It's sort of like somebody building a fireplace brick by brick by brick. And if you build the fireplace, you would assume that eventually the fire cannot be far behind. God is putting things in place for the advance of Christ's kingdom in ways that no other generation has ever seen in terms of the dramatic preparations. And that's why I believe he who has begun this good work intends to bring it to completion. And then there's the distinctive praying, as we've already heard today. There is a prayer movement in this world right now, unprecedented, not just in any generation of God's people, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of diversity, in terms of focus, in terms of its passion and direction. What I have heard, most of what I've heard that I would say is what the Spirit is saying to his church, is what I've heard as I sat and listened to God's people praying in so many parts of the body of Christ, in different languages, in different cultures, and I realized that they could not all be praying in this same direction if they weren't being stirred up by the Spirit of God. And where has this prayer movement come from? Has it come out of the flesh? I don't think so. There's nothing in my flesh that naturally wants to seek the Lord. Everything in my flesh wants to run away from Him. So if God's people are being stirred up to seek the face of God for Him, to do a work that will bring blessing to Him before it brings blessing to them, then I have to assume that's a work of the Holy Spirit, and then I have to assume God's Spirit would not stir God's people to pray like this and then leave us disappointed. He's got us praying like this because he intends to answer us. And finally, the determined people, voila. <laughs> and there, you are not a minority or a remnant. I know you feel that way. There are people like you all through the body of Christ. They may not talk the language that we talk here exactly, but they know something is desperately needed. They are hungry for more of Christ. They cannot rest till God does a new work among them. They are in every stream of the church. I have seen them. I have talked with them, and I believe that they are the first fruits, you, first fruits of the harvest that is to come, God's witness of what he's getting ready to do. So I believe for all of those reasons and more that we're on the threshold of something wonderful and we can pray and prepare for it without ever being worried about being disappointed. God's spirit wants to take God's word and reconvert God's people back to God's son for all that he is. Now, to understand this, all we have to do is study the New Testament because the New Testament is essentially a case study on a Christ awakening from beginning to end during that first generation. Now, if you were a leader like Peter and John and Paul and others, the only Bible you had was the Old Testament. So as you're trying to understand what's unfolding as we read about in the book of Acts, for example, you're trying to understand what's God doing here, you go back to the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord is the 39 books of the Old Testament. So here you are, you're Peter, you're James, you're John, uh, you're Paul, and uh, you're the writer of Hebrews, whoever. You, you're going back to the Old Testament to try and find passages that would help you interpret what this Christ awakening is really all about. So the question is, what is the most often quoted or referenced Old Testament passage used by New Testament writers to explain the dimensions of the Christ awakening movement in which they were involved? If there was time, now, I'd love to get some guesses from the audience, but the answer is, and most pastors don't know this, I can guarantee you that because I've tried it many times, and I would have known this a number of years ago, but the answer is Psalm 110, the most frequently quoted or referenced Old Testament passage by the New Testament, New Testament writers. Now listen just a moment, just listen. You know Psalm 110, I'm sure you do. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. For the Lord will extend your scepter from Zion, and you will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing in your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty. From the womb of the dawn, your youth will come to you like the dew. For the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the, the king priest, after the order of Melchizedek. 
And so they looked at what was going on. They said, this is about the ascension of Christ. This is about the extending of his scepter. This is about conquering people with the gospel and transforming them from enemies into friends, and they become his footstool. So we want to arise. We want to be with him in this battle. We clothe ourselves in holy majesty. We come from the womb of the dawn. Talk about awakening. We rise up with the dawn, and we will follow him to whom the Lord has sworn and will never take that word back, that he will conquer and he will be victorious and the hope is sure. That's, that's how they saw this Christ awakening. That's how they looked at it. Those are the lenses. And that's what I want to see God bring into the hearts and lives of his people again, a fresh revelation of what Psalm 110 is all about. Because you see, as far as the New Testament writers are concerned, there's one major facet of the redemptive work of Christ that was key to all the rest, and that was the ascension. Because apart from the ascension, no matter if he had lived a perfect life and died for our sins and been raised from the dead, if for any reason the Father was not able to say, my son, your work is finished, it is totally satisfying, now take the position to which you have every right because of the redemptive work you've done and sit at my right hand and begin to reign. If there was not a day like today is a day when the disciples stood and they watched him ascend and disappear into the clouds, if there was not a day when he took that position at the right hand of the Father, all the rest would be in vain. So on the day of Pentecost, when Peter is preaching his great sermon, beginning out of Joel chapter 2 and the outpouring of the Spirit, he does not preach the cross. Well, he preaches the cross, but not the atonement. Instead, he makes a beeline for Psalm 110, and then he concludes his message this way. Um, this Jesus, whom you have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And when they cried out, what must we do? They did not cry out, what must we do to be saved? They cried out, what must we do? These were like evangelicals. These were the most committed people to the Lord on planet earth. They had come for the celebration of Pentecost. They were coming from many nations, made many sacrifices to get there. Now they realized that we have crucified the one for whom we've been waiting for generations that he would come and fulfill all the promises and all the prophecies. What must we do means how do we get back into what God's doing and become a part of it because of what we have done to his Messiah. And to me, that's, I want to hear that in any great revival, that people begin to see the glory of who Jesus is and what he's up to and realize how far off of that we have been living and there's a cry in my heart, I don't want to miss out on him and his kingdom work any longer. What must I do to be woven back in to what God is doing through the reign of his son? He's called the Christ, Messiah, anointed one. That's the defining tower uh, uh, title. He has been made both Lord and Messiah, the one anointed to fulfill all the prophecies and promises. You know something? Every time you see the word Christ, that's not his last name. That's his title. And what's happened when you have the phrase Jesus Christ is what's happened is the person of Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the person of Jesus is so fully fulfilling the role of the Christos that those two words get wedded together so that you can't think Christ without thinking incarnation. You can't think of the incarnate Jesus without thinking of his role as Messiah. That was the kind of vision that occupied people in that first Christ awakening. Now, in case you're wondering if I'm a Trinitarian because I've talked so much about Jesus, let me put you at rest. Revelation chapter 5, there's the throne, the Father. There's the Lamb at the center of the throne, the Son. But how do I see the throne and how do I see the Lamb? Just one way. There's a lampstand that represents the sevenfold spirit who, who moves throughout the whole earth, John says. And it's the light of the lampstand that helps me see the Lamb at the center of the throne. And I go back to John chapter 16 when Jesus said, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, he will take, speaking of the Spirit, he will take what is mine and reveal it to you. That's a Christ awakening in a nutshell where the Spirit helps God's people to see all that God's Son is really all about. 
and we come to the place of brokenness and repentance. You know, I think the level of repentance that we're gonna have to experience that I hardly ever hear anybody talk about is where we're gonna be broken before the Father for what we have done to his Son, for how we have blasphemed him among the nations, how we have politicized him, how we have used him, how we have abused him, how we have dishonored him. It's what we've done to him that's gonna have to break our hearts in a time of a great Christ awakening. But as the Spirit takes what is the Father's, inherited by the Son, reveals it to us, it will not be a hard thing to do. It will be a painful thing to do. But it will not be hard to do. A Christ awakening is God's Spirit using God's Word to reconvert God's people back to God's Son for all that He is. Now, you probably thought at this point I was talking about the centrality of Christ, but I've not really been talking about that. The unfortunate thing is we stopped at the centrality of Christ and we have not moved into his supremacy. And the revival that's coming, the Christ awakening, the reconversion is to turn from centrality and begin to move into supremacy. Let me show you. Here's the definition. The centrality of Christ expresses his right to be at the center of of, uh, who I am, uh, where I'm headed, what I'm doing, and how I get blessed. And he has a right to be at the center of all of that, absolutely. But the supremacy of Christ, which is where the scripture basically lands, takes us a step beyond that. The supremacy of Christ is his right to keep me at the center of who he is, where he's headed, what he is doing, and how he gets blessed. And if you stop at centrality, it becomes like the San Gabriel Valley. Everything gets introverted. It becomes all about me, and eventually it's not about Christ anymore. So we have to get to centrality. We've got to press on in to supremacy. Let me give you some illustrations here. I I live close to the ocean. I live just out uh, across the Hudson River in the New Jersey side of New York City. I can get to the ocean in 45 minutes, take an empty water bottle. I can take a dipper and fill the water bottle with ocean water up to the top. If I do that, that's a picture of the centrality of Christ. Or I could take the empty water bottle and I could throw it as far as I could get it out into the ocean and it'll get filled with ocean water very rapidly, but then it's gonna go down and get caught up with the currents and go deeper and further than I could even begin to imagine. So God doesn't want us to be just filled with his son. He does. But he wants us to be filled with his son as we become involved at the center of who he is, where he's headed, what he's doing, and how he gets blessed. A plan. You've all heard the statement, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I don't want to get into it right now. Talk to me afterwards. I don't know any verse in the Bible that says that. If you do, please come and talk to me. But I do know The whole book of Ephesians chapter 1 says very clearly, God has a wonderful plan for his son to sum up everything under him in heaven and on earth, and he loves you and me enough to give us a place in it. That's the the reconversion that's going to have to happen in this Christ awakening. A God shelf, one of the great missionaries to India, E. Stanley Jones, was there for 40 years in in the last century, wrote a number of books, one of which is called The Christ of the India Road, and another called The Christ of the Round Table. And he talked about his early years working among Hindus. Now, India is very close to me. My three children are all adopted from India as little babies. They're full-grown adults now. But India has been a very close, and I've been there many times, and I know exactly what he's talking about. He would see people give their lives to Christ and then go to visit them a few days later, and he would find up on their God shelf, they still had the gods they'd been worshiping, and now a picture of Jesus right alongside of it. And finally, E. Stanley Jones says in his book, uh, Christ of the Indian Road, he said, I finally came to understand that Christ is not only the center, he's also the circumference. If he's just the center, then you can have him and other gods all in place. But if he's the circumference, then you need no other gods. He is everything. 